you are one of these very impressive, you know, personality. Like, firstly, you are a Virgin Galactic uh, inline astronaut. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk to about this. Uh, you're the former CEO of Richard Branson's B team. Um, you're a founder of the first sustainability tech fund that I've knew. Um, uh, and, 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 and you've, you've done that a long time ago, whereas now it's, it's, it's the trend somehow. Um, you're a visionary investor. And, um, and, and, and in not only, you know, Silicon Valley tech companies, but in space companies, in biotech companies, um, in future of work. Um, and so you're pushing really humanity forward with this, towards this new frontier with this fund. And, um, and we're going to talk about, about that, uh, but this next big thing you're working on. Uh, but before, uh, let's talk a little bit about your beginning, if you don't mind. Um, so fresh out of university around 2000, you co-founded Hyperfactory, uh, which was a mobile uh, agency. And this was, again, before everyone were talking about mobile. Um, and, and that's why Hyperfactory became awarded with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of, 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 of awards. Um, and then in 2011, you decided to shift your career in the ESG space, right? Um, Co-founding the B team. Um, and, 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 and so tell us a little bit, why this shift occurred, right? From tech to sustainability, how did that happen and, and why really? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a great question and I have a, a very personal uh, answer, but, you know, going back to your point about trying to be at the forefront, I think that's part of my own, I guess, makeup, my own DNA. I get really invested in where is the future going and what things can we build on top of. Uh, the waves that are behind us or coming and how might you want to shape them differently. So the mobile journey was very similar, you know, coming out of university, having the naivety to not be afraid to do anything uh, that might otherwise scare you when you're later. I like kind of surveyed what's changing in the world and what wave would I want to build something on? Mm. Um, so the, the change that happened, you know, that really shifted me towards ESG was the way I used to live was I was going to build a really successful company and I was going to sell it or make a lot of money. And then I was gonna use that to contribute or address society. That's what I had in my mind when I was a teenager and when I was at university and then when I started my company. Yeah. So what, what, what happened was in the recession last time, 2008, 2009, what happened was it was so challenging that the company was almost like on a near death moment, the hyper factory. And we had, you know, raised a bunch of money. We were burning through a lot of cash and I had to almost shut it down. I had to re relieve, I don't know, it was 80 staff members and close a bunch of offices. And at the end of 2008, like pretty much Christmas, we had cash to take us through to March, maybe April. So wow. the reality was it was in this moment that I was starting to get to clarity around what would happen if this, company died and yeah. whether I believed that I would get up and do the same thing again. And this kind of space in my life, which is uh, a moment, I suppose, of clear view was where the questioning started to occur. And that's where the personal exploration inward starts to occur to say, well, what is it you're trying to achieve in the world and yeah. what difference do you want to make? And if this company dies and your ego and identity and your 10 years you've put into it disappears into nothing and you have no money, no you know, bad reputation is beaten up and you have to go home, would you get up and do it all again? And so as I explored that question, it also encouraged me or it also kind of dawned on me, I could do that five or six times and maybe I could never succeed and then I would be 50 or 60 and according to the paradigm I had then, I would not have paid any attention to the problems and the issues that society and the environment had because the paradigm was do good, make some money and then do well. Yeah. So all of these things kind of collapsed on me. And that's when I realized I need to find another way to contribute 
while I'm building something, I need to be aware of what these problems in society are. And I want to use the talents that I've got to direct them at those problems, not some afterthought out of an outcome or a proceed from some other adventure. And it all kind of boiled down to the fact that if I was going to do something again, and you guys know, and you know, John, it's very, very difficult to build anything. To build a company is really challenging and it takes everything. Yeah. If I was going to do all that all over again, I decided it had to be worth, it had to be for something that was worth going down in flames for. And yeah. something that I thought, well, I'm doing something to fight to improve the state of the world. I'm doing something to fight for a cause or an issue that even if I failed, I would feel proud about the failure as much as anything because I tried to tackle something that made a difference. Yeah. And that's really the thing that changed in my mind. And it might sound ridiculous or corny, but it happened no, like, not. really, really quickly. Like within a few days, that clarity came um, you know, before Christmas. And from then on, it was like, well, I don't know shit about these problems. So I'm back at grasshopper beginner stage and learning stage because I don't know what I don't know. And that was the first, you know, the last 10 years, those are the first steps. Well, wow, that, that's amazing, uh, Derek. It's really about building that legacy, right? And, and you can do that through building a very successful company, trying to chase unicorns, or maybe by trying to empower other people in that industry climate related. I mean, there's so many big problems that our generation have to face, really. If you think about this, our parents had to avoid the nuclear disaster, right? Uh, and they made the wall of Berlin fall. My grandma and, and your grandparents have fight the Nazi Reich, right? Was, which was supposed to stay for a thousand years. So our generation is really, you know, saving our society from destructing its, its own planet, right? Uh, and maybe going to space, that, that's the two better. So, so it's interesting, it's been the second time we have people sharing a near death experience in our show. Um, but for you, it was a, a business near death experience. Whereas um, the previous one was an actual uh, real death. And, and when you think about this, Spinoza, I think the philosopher, had, had been struck by a thunder when he was sitting under a tree. And, and many people who have got to really change the world had that near-death experience. So I'm wondering, is that really something we need to have to start doing something interesting? <laughs> I hope not. It's a great um, question because you can't, I can't impart this um, experience and transformation sounds maybe too strong, but this paradigm shift that occurred with me or within me, you can't impart and move someone else. They need to have their own movement, their own shift. Yeah. And people can get things, especially at the moment when they're being surrounded by it, they can get it intellectually. They can get it that the climate's got issues. They can get it that there are inequalities intellectually, but to embody it in a um, emotional and a feeling sense and a sense that moves you, I do believe something personal has to happen to individuals. Some experience, it doesn't need to be a near death, although we know from the research, the literature, the stories you tell, people who have that experience or something happens to someone they love or something they lose their job. Like these are things that are about death of ego, death of a paradigm, death of a, a maybe a physical death. For me, the company death, it's a death like other deaths. You know, if you lose a company, it's a different type. It's ego related. It's also, uh, it is an entity. And when it yeah. goes down, it has the same kind of grief effects as yeah. you know, losing something. So I think there are these issues where people need something to help them jolt them into a transformation. And for me, I'm just lucky that it happened you know, pretty early. Um, yeah. And, you know, the other benefit was it actually made me a lot clearer. And so I could navigate, which was a time that was extremely stressful, where the option could be to implode and close in and, and not succeed in keeping this company alive because yeah. it was so difficult. But actually, it gave me the ability to be impartial and really clear about making the brutal decisions to keep the company alive in order to make it through to the other side. And so it, it always has this kind of 
self-protecting force when you are able to respond, not out of fear, but out of kind of a place of hope. Um, and that's, you know, that's the, the blessing that I had in that, in that experience. I'd much rather have that near-death experience than some other physical near-death experience. Yeah, you still have your limbs and... Uh... Yeah. And um, no, that's a great lesson of resilience. Uh, thank you for sharing that. So the phoenix that rose out of the 2008 ashes was plan B, right? Eventually, you moved on to start plan B in 2011 or something, right? Along with a lot of other big CEOs like Richard Branson and all like that. So could you talk to us about how from from this moment of realization you mentioned in an ego dis, death this new resolve that you had how did you put it into action and how did you mobilize this with with this bunch of uh, like-minded ceos into plan b so i uh first of all i had to finish the job at the company that i was at right like i was still in there and so I, um, we kept it alive, focused heavily on the, its vital signs and kind of getting it into good shape and eventually uh, exited it, which was a really positive outcome uh, for me and for my family. And I think for the overall team in the organization too, you know, some of those team members have been at that company all the way through to like even maybe a year or two ago who had been with us since 2005. So that had to happen first. And so I had to keep my eye on completing a task, not abandoning something. But then the transition was, you know, back to what I mentioned, the beginner's mind. And this, I guess, is something that I'm really unafraid of. And I think people should be less afraid of, which is being willing to be an absolute beginner again. So this is, you know, I'm 30 something at this point. Uh, so, okay, I don't know anything about what sustainability is. I don't know anything about anything to do with fossil fuels, uh, the state of poverty, the global uh, millennium development goals, all that kind of stuff. So my theory was, well, I need to learn. I have skills. I can take things from a blank piece of paper to create something. I can build a company. I'm an entrepreneur. I can think like a designer, but I don't know anything about these other sectors. So my, my, my idea was to donate a year of my time as I left the hyperfactory to any organization where I could contribute something meaningful by creating and having entrepreneurial energy, but I would learn by being in an environment that was a specialist or leader in thinking about the state of the world and the future of kind of capitalism and sustainability. That was my decision. I didn't know how I was going to end up. I thought I'd maybe be at university or microfinance organizations, some startups. I didn't have any fixed view. I met Richard Branson through, you know, Virgin Galactic. And I told him pretty much that same story. And he said, well, next year, I mean, for years, actually, we've been trying to build this group of people, these leaders who are like business leaders trying to advance sustainability. And we don't have the nucleus who's going to catalyze this organization. And so that became, you know, by the end of the evening, we both agreed that that's what I would do for the next year. And so I gave a whole year to that project and stayed on uh, thereafter. And that whole experience, I was building and creating value by creating an organization and a team and designing this plan B for this B team. But at the same time, I was getting the absolute best MBA boot camp, you know, taken to school with all of the uh, brightest lights of sustainability. So it was a really, I mean, I don't know who got the better end of the bargain, but I got a pretty amazing end because I learned so much in amongst the brightest people in the world about the issues that we've got, but also about how people have tried to tackle them since the 60s and 70s. And um, that became my, you know, my uh, earning my stripes, I suppose, 10 years ago as I transitioned. That does sound like a boot camp. And it seems to me like that's the best way for a lot of people to learn. So that I was mean, that's, 10 that's years also, ago. if I may, it, it's also not everybody who can, <laughs> I mean, if I say, oh, I have a, a year to kill to you, Derek. Uh, I'm not going to get to Richard Branson next week, right? So, <laughs> so can you develop a little bit more on that, please? <laughs> well, okay, so that's an interesting one. We I haven't talked about this much, but there are certain windows where you have an opportunity with someone or a person or an experience, uh -huh. and you're like, I can take this experience and I can ex enjoy it and I can take it for what it is, or I can have a swing and I can use this opportunity if I think I'm being motivated by the right things 
like a desire to make a difference, contribute, help someone, a positive motivation that's coming from a place of giving and contribution as opposed to taking, if you have that deep conviction and you take that swing and it hits, it can totally transform the trajectory of where you're going, right? And so that's, that's the kind of window that occurred in that moment. I could have done nothing for those few days from when I was interacting with them, but I made the decision to do something bold and creative and just swing at it. And what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. Um, and it's those moments that sometimes I think people let by, but those are the ones that I call them like they're the forks in the road and you, you have to choose. Are you willing to open up the fork or are you just going to go down the path? And so that's an example where plenty of other people could make those approaches to different types of people, but it takes a sense of conviction and courage to actually go and do it. But yeah. the downside is almost zero, you know, if you're motivated from the right place. Yeah. So you basically demonstrated that to Richard Branson in this dinner you had. You, you, you swung for it, right? Like you said, you somehow sh expressed to him that this is, what, this is what you want to focus on, what you're willing to put your time in. You want to contribute to the planet. This isn't like a, a greedy uh, business opportunity that, that, like you said, you just want to take away from the planet. This is something that you want to actually give. And you, sh you showed to him that this is something that you're willing to take on and take a swing at. And you demonstrated this courage the and the sense is, of giving to him. It's not every day that someone comes up to you and says, what do you want to do with one year of my life? You know, it's one 80th of my entire life. It'd be like one 60th of my, my adult existence kind of thing. So yeah. it's the, again, it's, the, it's like, well, if you really believe in something, how much are you willing to go for it? And of course, I was in a unique position because we'd sold the company. I had some money. I didn't have to work at that time for some years. I could have made these decisions. Not everyone can. Yeah. But even still, people who do are, are in those situations, it's not common that someone might come up to you and say, hey, what can I build for free? For a year if it's going to make a difference if it's going to help you do something that's going to change the world and i think those kinds of out of the box ideas are you know exciting to pursue they might not work but it's that's worth a, it it's giving me some ideas i think i'm going to propose that to somebody so yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good model for yeah the having the chops to pitch to someone so that well, was 10 years ago right that was you started yeah. started plan b around 10 years ago right that was 2011 Fast forward now is 2021. It was basically 10 years ago. So would you say that Plan B was able to fulfill its mission in the past 10 years? What can, and can you give some examples on, yeah. on, on things about in Plan B that you're proud of, that, that have made a contribution to the world? So the team itself, we call the, the B team, which is still what it's called, bteam.org. We put together a draft of what we thought plan B looked like in the face of plan A being capitalism as usual, not going to get the job done for this generation. And that capitalism as usual is epitomized in the Milton Friedman profit maximization at all costs, like the business of business is only to maximize profits. Anything outside of that question shouldn't be dealt with by business. And that is what we've taught the brightest of people, all the brightest students of business basically from like the seventies on, right? For 30 years, that's what they were told. So the plan B model was like, what would it look like if you described 10 or 12 principles that were different? Like how would you treat the planet? What would you think about the purpose of the, the organization was? How would you think about transparency? How would you think about accounting and measures? Like if you're only measuring money, how you're measuring the impact positive or negative to society, the environment. So the plan was kind of like a scaffolding. The organization itself, it was hard to know what could you achieve with a group like this, group of people, CEOs, you know, thought leaders, uh, Nobel Prize winners of people that are trying to different uh, pilot different models of a business. One thing that we know is that if you get an amazing group of people and they all stand for something and they're all incredible, if they all stand for the same thing and push on that button consistently, it can create change. And the biggest thing I think that I'm proud of with B Team Achieve was during the lead up to the Paris Agreements, is that the whole team agreed that they were all going to uh, focus on pushing hard that the target in the Paris Agreement shouldn't be two degrees, it should be 1.5 degrees. And if they used every resources, that, every resources that they had, whether it was conversations with presidents or CEOs or whoever, to convince people that the agreement needs to be more aggressive as a framework. And if that's all those people did for a year, and if it made some difference in changing the agreement, that would be a huge win. And to me, like that's an example of a team of influence and power contributing to something um, 
that that matters in the end. And you know, I think they played a role. Uh, it may have been small, it may have been larger, but they played a role definitely in helping that happen. Um, yeah. So that's and really that history. history. And I know that the person who architected that agreement, Christiana Figueres, I know that she was appreciative of that. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, after I've left many years after, she is now part of the B team. So she has joined that team to continue to help influence and shape. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so, so, no, I, I, I'm just thinking, it's all come down to this degree, right, at the end. So when, when, you, when you wake up in the morning, you, you know, many people of our generation, they just don't know what to do with their life, right? They're depressed. They're what we call those doomers, right? It's a new term, doomer. Wow. And, um, and, um, and there's the Zoomer, you know, the Gen Z like, that stays on Zoom. And, but, but yeah, the Zoomer generation were all depressed. You know, those, those people around 30s, they don't know what to do. So they just drink alcohol. And, and some of them, they had this, uh, this, this light from God or something that tell them, okay, go start an ESG company, <laughs> right? Um, and and that's, that's pretty cool. But, but a lot of them don't know what are the solutions available because for a complex problem such as climate it's not like you build a website and then you sell it to customers right uh, when, when you talk about reversing that geothermical machine which is our planet it's a little bit more than that it's going to take some deep tech it's going to take some some carbon capture it's going to take some real revolution in how we produce energy, how we produce food. Um, and, and that's really all, all about, um, you know, the type of things that interest you now with IRIVC, right? Um, so, so can you share us a little bit more about what's been done with IRIVC? Um, what's the focus has been and, and what's the next big thing coming up? So just context. So Aero VC is your most recent project that you're working on now after Plan B, right? You're not active in Plan no. B at the moment. Your Aero VC is your primary focus right now. So yeah, yeah. yeah I, I was John's the, question. Yeah, yeah. I, I was at the B team at the beginning, helped create it. You know, 2012 to 2014, and then went on to do other things in, in the U.S., including building a company builder that started up other companies and other things. And we started prototyping Aero VC as a fund. Um, in 20, uh, well, we were designing in 2016, we started investing in 2017. So, um, in a small way and then a growing way and, and now a growing way. And we were investing in a broader sustainability agenda. And now we are more increasingly focused on climate only. Um, although we've been doing climate since, since 2017. So your, your question, your point, John, about uh, it's not like you can just build an app or build a website is a real, it's a real point, right? Cause if you want to make, if you want to do something, you want to start something, it's not necessarily as easy as what you may have seen in the last 10, 15 years of what you could start up. People could start up in the garage, just hack away. And all of a sudden there's an app over, over that weekend and you go live and it could be anything, right? It could be gaming. It could be commerce. It could be whatever. It's not, necessarily as simple as that there is a lot of hard tech that's at play right as you mentioned um all those things you mentioned are categories that we've invested in and that we think are important the future of food which is as much you know we come at it firstly as a climate perspective but there's other perspectives there's human rights animal rights environmental uh pollution there's all sorts of angles to the future of food that's essentially agriculture in the way that we've done it industrial wise Industrialized farming uh, has enormous methane, greenhouse gas emissions. It has runoff issues. It's got lots of issues with soil, all that kind of stuff. So we're saying, how can you create protein in a different way? How can you create milk, dairy, meat, fish, you know, the overfishing of the oceans, all those kinds of things are all contributors to problems in the broader sense of sustainability and specifically in the sense of carbon and climate change. So we look at companies across the spectrum that are trying to reverse 
that by creating alternatives, whether they're plant-based, cell-based, whatever they may be. We've done a few deals in that space. We think if the world shifts a lot of its diet to plant-based or alternative models, it will help transition uh, you know, carbon reduction. The second category you mentioned is carbon capture, recycling, uh, utilization and storage. That's a burgeoning field, which historically has been economically not really possible. It's been too expensive to do this stuff, but now we're finding technologies that can be, can hit the, the price that people um, can pay for the carbon or they can convert the carbon into other uses that can be produced into other outcomes, other, other products. So this is about taking carbon out of the air or it might be taking it out of an industrial process where a, a particular plant is emitting it. So you'd take it out of that exhaust and then you'd capture it or convert it into something. So this field I think is going to be fraught with really interesting and crazy technologies, but also some really inspiring and successful ones. And so we've done a couple, couple deals in that, in that space. Um, but again, it's, it's harder tech. There is software related technology that is also around. Like we've invested in a company called carbon chain, which is mapping the carbon footprint of commodities, like basically creating a database and a platform that will be informed by AI and their mapping of what is a carbon footprint when you take something out of a mine, when you transport it in a truck, when you process it in a factory, when you put it on a ship and kind of like stringing all that together to see end to end, what is the carbon footprint of, uh, of a particular industrial product. Fascinating. So, so there's lots of different options. And then on the very heavy side, which is the hardest, they call them, you know, hard to abate sectors. Unfortunately, we're coming at it at the end of this journey in terms of us and our awareness. The hardest to abate sectors, we now have to tackle head on. And that is like steel, concrete, uh, you know, shipping, aviation. Um, aviation is about alternative fuels. That kind of stuff is way beyond our pay grade. But things like concrete, where there's probably a million different ways you could make concrete. At the yeah. moment, the way it's made, 99.9% .9 of the way it's made, it contributes to becoming, you know, contributing to 5 to 8% of all greenhouse gases. Yeah. So the way you make it emits greenhouse gas massive amounts. The way you heat the process emits heaps of greenhouse gases. So that's a sector that looks hard. It's difficult. You can't just hack away on your, on your laptop. It takes deep science and deep technology and those kinds of sectors are difficult, but will create huge winners. And, you know, we're interested in those as much as we are as the future of food, as we are as the carbon chains of the world. Yeah, I, I read recently that concrete and uh, building roads account actually for as much CO2 emissions uh, as flights. This is crazy. Like, uh, I think it's more. More, maybe it's even more. Yeah, maybe yeah. That's crazy. I think it might be more. Right. We, we don't think about this. Uh, no, no. It's the Just built environment. Around. Yeah, the built environment we don't think about. We think about how we use things. Recycling, yeah. electric vehicles, turn the lights on. Take a shower. <laughs> yeah, take a shorter shower. That's what we've been uh, brainwashed into so far to think yeah. is going to solve things. I haven't gone into as far as thinking about why has it taken us so long to make it part of the mainstream dialogue as to the problem being in how we make things? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to get person. too political, but yeah. I, I, I've seen one of the marketing campaign of BP uh, in the early uh, 2000 was exactly that. So it was making people think taking a shower would be, you know, the culprit. Um, um, but anyway, um, this is interesting numbers. And so, so that's what you've, you guys have been doing. And I know with this frontier tech, you know, you've been investing into space as well. Um, you're, you're on the line to be a Virgin Galactic astronaut yourself as well. Tell us about this frontier fund that you are looking at right now. So when we started, we were broader sustainability as we were navigating, right? So anything that was kind of contributing, tackling a, a sustainable development goal. Um, you know, we had a future of work and learning portfolio and we had health care, I mean, future food, other carbon issues. So in this next fund, we, we've carved out like a frontier part of the fund. 
And we basically call it frontier because it's, it's things that are at a frontier or a breakthrough on the people side. Just so we're clear, these are all under Aero VC. Yeah, they're all under okay. Aero VC. Yeah. So frontier uh, is really, if you think about climate, is the planet side, frontier is the people side. Um, and it's really about what, what interesting and unique special opportunities we come across that are breakthroughs for the human uh, humanity side. And that includes things like, you know, we've looked at lots of mental health deals. We did a, an investment in a company called Gilgamesh, which is using psychedelics to address mental health and addiction issues. We've invested in a company called 54 Genes, which 54 Gene, which is creating the first African-based DNA biobank, which when we heard that there wasn't such a thing, we were, you know, shocked because we've known about DNA biobanks for 20 years with 23andMe and other companies like that. Um, and so we look where there's a, an obvious breakthrough that needs to happen. And sometimes we think about it and we go find something like mental health. We were looking for a long time for interesting companies, or sometimes we just come across them like a 54 gene. Included in that is these kind of outer limits of exploration, science and technology where sometimes the rationale is really clear. So it's a space, for example, for us is about the human spirit to explore and be the adventurer. But in the terms of the climate's perspective, we still think space is actually a, a contributor to addressing uh, the issues in, in climate change and those, those that are associated. Although there's lots of criticism at the moment that you know space tourism and stuff is kind of counter to that, which is fair. But the point I often like to bring up is without the technologies that we're advancing in space and that we had advanced over the last 30 years, 40 years, we wouldn't even really understand or know that we're in a problem in the first place. Like it's only due to the eyes in the sky and the acute sensitivity of the measurements and technologies that are up there that we can measure the minuteness of the methane, the, the sea level rises, the acidity, all the issues that are being monitored by what is essentially the vital signs monitoring system up in space. And so if we can accelerate that to make it better, more accurate, more responsive as we make this transition, that can only uh, help us. And, yeah. you know, that to me is the bigger picture serves the, the purpose of being involved in this sector. Um, personally, it's just something I've always loved and, you know, since whatever, when I was eight or nine. And so that's the moment that it became an option for humans to be a part of something like that. I, you know, I, I um, put, my ha put my hand up. So you've identified all these, so you've created all these funds and you've outlined all these key industries that are solutions to problems we face in terms of sustainability. So you're obviously very keyed into this. You're an investor. You've worked in sustainability for a long time. So this question goes to our audience. It's directed to our audience. Like we said earlier, it's about 70% startups and 30% Investor. So the question is about a framework, perhaps, on how to identify these, these key industries. So it would be a two-part question. So for a startup, how would they go about identifying industries that are worth doubling down on? And as well as for investors, how would they identify industries that are worth investing in? Basically, mm -hmm. how do we identify industries that are worth doubling down on because of their opportunity and because of their impact? Yeah. I mean, for us and for me, you know, it, it's an evolving, constantly rolling process. And so when you start, like if I go back 10 years, I've got, you know, a base of no knowledge. So you just kind of latch on to where you can start learning and learning uh, about a particular field. For me, the first field that really hooked me, was microfinance. It was the most obvious thing I could relate to. I was like, oh, it's using business finance in a way to address an issue. And so it was like kindergarten for you know, sustainability and, and uh, impact. Um, for AeroVC in the last five years, we just you know, put up a sign and said, ventures that are trying to tackle things that contribute to the SDGs. That's about as, that's about as basic as the framework that we had. And we had some very simple rules, like the founder's mission must be to contribute or solve one of these. That must be the point of the company, not like a byproduct. It mustn't, it mustn't be an outcome that is ancillary. 
the whole entity must exist to achieve this solution. And so as we do that, we start to see more and more deals and we start to see more and more categories and we get more and more interested and then we pick and choose the ones that resonate with us. So is there a more structured way to do this? You know, I mean, there are 17 SDGs, I think. It's like there's a lot of issues. So if you think you want to create your own map that maps all of these, I mean, you might be, and this is what happens to some families and investors. You might be in theory world for about five years because you could spend three years just getting your head around water, you know? And so there's so many topics that unless you choose a few that you want to get deep into quicker that resonate with you, you could be sitting up in the academic theoretical world without actually acting for a long time. So for us, it's like learn by doing, pick a few that you know, and then you get. And so food for us came instinctively. And then the more we did it, the more we learned, the more we felt comfortable in it. Carbon capture, we were a bit slower to get into. The more we learned, the more we get comfortable. So to me, I think it's like, you look at the issues, you can find different reports that might navigate the issues themselves. But once you get down another layer, you've got to start picking ones that you think you resonate with as an investor that you might want to learn more about. And then you can start getting you know, deeper. From a founder's perspective, founding companies and anything like that is so difficult that you have to find something you really, really care about. That's the only way you're going to build a company. You've got to find a problem that you actually deeply care about. And you may already have that. And then you've got to find a way to figure out what the solution is. If you haven't, then you want to be drowning in problems until you find one that just grabs you by the throat and says, it's your duty to solve this, this issue or get involved in this issue. I, don't, I think it's very hard to build a company in sustainability or impact kind of lens from a, a theoretical first saying, oh, this looks like a problem. I might go and you know, try and build a company. I think you have to dive in, get stuck in, and almost like have that heart attack where you're like, this is ridiculous. I've got to solve this. And then it gives you the motivation to learn all about it, to address it. Um, I mean, that, that's how I feel about it. But there's probably 50,000 different ways you could cut it. No, that's an excellent way to look at it. Just start from the building blocks of just looking at the problems around you, right? Because that's, that's where you start. Why, why go further if you can't even find solutions to the things around you? And if there's no solutions, that probably means there hasn't been a startup on that topic yet. So yeah. that, that's, that's a good advice. And you mentioned so SDGs. Someone, yep. someone might say, Jet, well, how do I find out problems? Well, you just block two days out of your calendar and just read online and read a bunch of different articles that are at the top level. And then you'll start going down spirals and finding out. And then you would find out the things that John and I just spoke about, which is, did you know the built environment contributes, you know, 8% of, you know, did you know that? Like, that's crazy. Did you know that the foundation in your house emits X blah, blah, blah. Once you realize that you're like, wow. And there's thousands of those, of those yeah. problems, you know? Um, and then you figure out, well, am I the person to solve that? Or am I the person to solve some other problem? So that question was to the, to the upstarts, people that want to start companies and invest in things. The next question is for the doomers or, or at least how to talk to the doomers, right? So I think the next question would be, how would an upstart convey their message to the world that their problem is worth solving, that ESG is something worth tackling? How do, you, how do you bring go about bringing these obscure problems and pitching it to the mainstream and having people care about it, invest in it, and participate in it? Well, I, I think where we started, you know, that the interest in these issues has never been higher, right? People are getting a certain level of consciousness around the need and that's good. And the desire and the demand to put capital to work and to solve these issues and to back companies that are doing that or back nonprofits because there's massive role for nonprofits as well. Um, so that's a positive because, you know, 20 years ago, that wouldn't been the case 10 years ago. Um, and if you're building something, if it's a for-profit company, then you want to be able to pitch something that is compelling on all fronts. The problem is real. Your solution is real and it's going to scale and it's going to be able to make uh, money and make a difference. And by having the combination of all those things, 
you can draw on all the incentives that people have, which are they want to contribute, they want to make a difference, but they also want returns. And that's kind of where we, we sit. If you're in a nonprofit world and you have a different set of, you know, collective of issues that you're trying to deal with, but there's still equally lots of people trying to support issues out there if they've got capital um, to address people tackling things in, you know, in different ways. I think right now, particularly climate and environmentally, uh, it's never been a better time to start a company because the interest, the demand, the problem, the size of the problem, the amount of capital coming in has been, you know, more than ever and probably will continue to grow year on year on year. So there aren't that many excuses why you wouldn't want to. Do you remember, Derek, when uh, we were in New York together? And uh, that was, what, in 2017, I guess, uh, for this Cairo Society event. Yeah. We were so far from this. Like, everyone was building, like, an e-commerce app or, or, like, a pet food delivery app. Uh, and even this core team of, of Keros, uh, which, which was really a big inspiration for us to build Atlas, the solutions were kind of, you know, edgy, right? But no, literally five years, six years later, everybody is talking about ESG, right? Um, so this is, this is crazy to me how fast this 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 generation can mobilize around a topic and not only the generation of entrepreneurs but the generation of more successful wealth can also mobilize right if you look at how this ESG sustainability have mobilized institutional investors the past five years it's incredible and and this is where you have been the first that I know uh, to, to create that. And that's where you're one of the biggest in the world right now in this space. So I want to, I want to, I want to thank you for instilling these ideas, this seed in my mind a few years back and, uh, and let it grow without touching it. Um, and I really hope this interview with, will, will have, the same effect to the viewers, right? You see it in their mind. I love that, John, because um, you know, I do remember those conversations we had about, you know, I mean, even talking about get links and how can you align it with the, 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 the issues that we've got. So yeah. it's extraordinary to see you pick up Atlas and, and push it forward and take it in this direction. And as you said, I haven't kind of jumped in and tried to tell you what to do or anything at all, but I've loved watching it from afar. But one thing I need to kind of... Um, acknowledge is people have been doing this for a really long time and i think the danger is for people to not recognize that this is a 50 years maybe 40 50 years mm. um people started of Rome, right? a really long time ago yeah trying to get this message through and you have uh, what would you call them? Like the godfathers of this movement that I think most of the current, let's say new movement don't really, they're not really aware of them. And I'm thinking about maybe creating an article or something to connect all the dots going back. Um, and that's, that's where I think you also have to acknowledge the people, the, the, the shoulders, you know, of the giants that you're standing on and, it is, there's one guy that's you know pretty well known, Ray Anderson, for his carpet company called Interface, where several decades ago he had set a goal, mission zero, to be zero waste as a highly polluting industrialized carpet manufacturer. I can't remember when he said it. I think it was in the 90s. And so it's you know a really long time ago. Someone like him who had a very large company who had decided that was his life's goal, and he passed away some years ago without it being achieved. But for people like that and, you know, people often point to Ben and Jerry's as being really early pioneers of stakeholder capitalism in Vermont. Uh, I think that was in the seventies or something like that. So there is a trail going back of people who have been saying these kinds of things, trying to do things differently for a really long time. Paul Hawken, who wrote the book Ecology of Commerce in the nineties and uh, is now part of 
some more high profile initiatives. But again, someone like that who's been going on with this stuff for, for decades and decades. So it's important that we somehow find ways to constantly and regularly acknowledge and hark back to those, I guess, pioneers of these movements um, yeah. trying to do what they could, you know, from the outset, telling us, warning us for a very long time. Yeah. Well, if you want to write about this, um, let's do it together on the newsletter. <laughs> We'd love to help you because it's going to be a lot of work. But um, yeah, it it's should be interesting to do a retrospective on 50 years of sustainability. Um, yeah, and I think what's also useful in my mind I had was maybe pinpointing people to key articles and key books and key talks. Yeah. So people can see it's almost like a um, breadcrumb trail. Yeah. yeah it's, you're creating a rabbit hole for people to go in. <laughs> it's a great way of initi initiating. Exactly. Numbers. It's initiation. Yeah. Um, like the, yeah. So I'm very excited to do that. I might do that over the summer, which is because I'm in New Zealand. It's about to begin. Um, yeah. I think it's a great project because as you said, the interest now is so high. Yeah. It's almost like there's probably a, you know, university, you have this 101 papers. There's one of yeah. those that could be more comprehensive that I think maybe someone's already written it. So maybe someone will respond to this talk and say, look, there's something here that has done that. And that'd be cool too. Cause then I could share it and we could share yeah. it. Uh, sure. people. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for, for being an investor. Uh, for such a long time and, and still catching up with us and, and enlightening us. Um, so, so I want to finish this interview with an advice, uh, an advice to, to, to our Atlas uh, society, um, to its members, and, and also to any investors watching, right? Um, so you say you believe that each of us here is here to do something uh, and build a legacy, right? Um, and you've got that realization happening. We've heard the story now. Um, it's about purpose, right? It, it's about how do you best use your limited time on earth? Um, so, so I like that journey we've mentioned during that interview and just to close down as an advice, how does one get started with finding that purpose in life? on this planet, right? <laughs> Just the small questions, John. It's a big philosophical question, but you're the guy. Well, so first of all, I don't, I don't generally use the word legacy so much. I, I don't use it because I think that means you're like looking, you know, you're kind of looking forward to look back and say, what have I left or done versus the working from a place of presence, like what is it that you're expressing in the present, right? And what is your, Mindfulness. yeah, it, well, what, what is your, um, what is what you're trying to do in the now? Like, because that's where you are. You're not 50 years down the track, looking back, you're here and you're trying to use the time that you're here in the way that is contributes is positive, but is mostly, I hope aligned with, who it is you, you think you are, right? And I think this is a very difficult, um, it is a really difficult question because it changes, I think. I think it evolves and it changes and it doesn't mean that what you thought it was seven years ago is going to be what it is in seven years. But I don't, I don't think there are any answers or any shortcuts, but practical, uh, I guess, tips are, for me at least, you have to have space in your life to have conversations with yourself. Like you have to have space to quieten everything around you such that it's kind of like there's this big din and it just goes quieter and quieter such that you can ex communicate with what it is you're trying to express to yourself. Mm. One way to do that as well is through writing and journaling in your own way to have a dialogue with what you're thinking and what you're not thinking and then critically assessing the things that you're doing and that you're being in the world and whether they're true and what makes you anxious and what makes you um, uncomfortable and finding out what doesn't fit and equally going on the other side and says what makes you sing and what makes you feel alive and what really makes you inspired and is there enough of that in your world? And you obviously follow the things that are inspiring and make you feel alive and try and figure out, well, how does that connect with what I'm doing 
in the day to day? Is what I'm doing in the day to day matching that, or is it against it, or is it kind of neutral? And you're trying to bring the two things together. I don't believe in kind of like a work life balance or any of those kind of ideas. I think it's an integration, right? You're trying to bring together what you're trying to express in the world through the work that you do in a meaningful way that is true to you. That you look back and you you can say, or you look at it in the present, you can say, this is honest and true. And I'm not doing something that's shortchanging me or shortchanging something that I'm trying to stand up for. There's no shortcut, I think, to figuring that out. But if you're not doing the work to have that conversation, then I think there's very little chance you'll figure it out. So the most practical thing is to create space in your week where there isn't anything else to do other than that. Think about that conversation with yourself, writing about it, reflecting on it, and kind of calibrating, you know, going forward. And the, the, the stress of it all at the moment is people just run from one thing to the next, whether it's a Zoom to a Zoom or from a job to a bus or a train to a something, and they don't create the space to reflect enough, I think, on that particular essence of, well, is this all actually true to what I'm trying to be in the world? From this answer, I'm sensing the Eastern philosopher in you, Derek, allowing for a space of reflection because I've, I've, I've found that too. I, my advice to people, I mean, you're talking about allowing, cultivating the sense of self-awareness, right? And in order to do that, you need to allow yourself moments where, where you're not monkey brained and jumping around from one thing to another, but actually sitting either. It doesn't have to be meditation. Like you said, it can be journaling. It can be taking a walk, but unplugging basically and letting all the dust settle and, and, allowing the glaring perhaps demons or worries that you have to surface themselves. Like I, I went to a 10 day meditation retreat and oh my God, unplugged and all the demons came out, right? These were, these were all things that my priorities like were so apparent. So yeah, I, I, I do appreciate uh, what, what you're saying there in terms of it's, it's not, it may not be to a lot of people. It may be an unsatisfying answer because they want a, an actual blueprint of like, do this, do this, and you'll find your purpose. But perhaps sometimes the answer is to do the opposite, is to stop doing for a while and allowing certain things to settle down on their own. Beautifully said, Jed. No, yeah. we, 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 we've, we've, we've got that great, um, great advice for everybody. It's a bit metaphysical. Um, I really like it. And, and this is really defining who you are. And, and, and as you are a leader of this space, I guess, um, this is an example that a lot have to follow. So, um, so it was great. We've, we've got through a lot today. We've gone through your past, your inspiration, uh, your achievements, um, and, and also advices for all of us in Atlas Society as an investor, as an entrepreneur. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Derek, for, for joining us today. And then hopefully we'll have more of these discussions uh, <laughs> Uh, I can together. talk about that, that stuff, you know, towards the end for a very long time. Um, yeah. I really appreciate, you know, the time to spend with you and also all the, the kind words, John, but, you know, just to be clear, like it still feels to me every day, like I'm a beginner. And I think that's part of um, the trick as well, like to regularly put yourself in a beginner mindset and uh, always be open to learning and growing. And I think that helps. Uh, with, with everything that we've talked about today. So I hope some of this is of, of interest of use to the people, you know, that are following you and helping build the Atlas Society. Uh, and I look forward to any, you know, further conversations, future conversations that you have and, and everything else that you're, you're up to at the moment. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Jet. And I see you next time.